This episode is made possible by the support we get from Fort Collins Kia. If you are in the market for any electric Kia, not only do they never add market adjustments, they will deliver your car to you anywhere in the 48 contiguous states for out-of-spec viewers. More information in the link in the show notes. Hello, and welcome back to the Out of Spec podcast. I'm your host, Francie. Hope you've been having a lovely day and that you're ready to hear about some more electric news, electric happenings in the EV world. Of course, in this industry that is just ripe with possibilities, there are many startups that are paving the way to a cleaner and simply better transportation system all over the U.S. and all across the world. This ranges from getting more electric vehicles in the hands of everyday people, improving public transit, scaling car sharing programs, and the large-scale electrification of fleets. And it's no surprise to anyone that this isn't simple or easy to change the way that we do things, but that's no reason to hold us back from innovation, of course. And just for some stats to set the stage on the importance of electrification and to put things into a bit of perspective for this conversation today, Highway vehicles release about 1.5 billion tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere each year, mostly in the form of carbon dioxide, which is a direct contributor to global climate change. In fact, each gallon of gasoline that you burn creates 20 pounds of greenhouse gases. That's roughly five to nine tons of greenhouse gases each year for a typical vehicle. These stats I took from the U.S. Department of Energy. Today, we are speaking with Ezra Goldman, co-founder and CEO of Upshift, with a mission to eliminate car ownership, car accidents, and carbon emissions, or yeah, carbon emissions while creating living jobs in livable cities. And we are going to talk about a few things, including how Upshift is going to do this and is doing this, and then open up the conversation a bit to the obstacles that are standing in the way of commercial fleet electrification at this time, so we can all better understand what really is going on. So welcome, Ezra. It is great to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Francie. So great to be here. Yes. And one thing I'd like to point out is that Upshift is a part of Minis, like Mini Cooper's Urban X program, which was started in 2016 for startups reimagining city life. And the program is focused on customer traction, product development, fundraising. It gives, you know, high potential founders a chance to change what's possible in cities around the world. It's a really cool program going on. And I will link to their site and the program in the show notes. So if you're curious, you can check it out. So that's pretty cool, Ezra. Yeah, that was a uh, great. Pro- We're not currently in that program, but we did okay. do that program. And uh, yeah, that was backed by uh, Third Sphere and Mini. Uh, we're also right now actually actively in 500 Global, which is a, another startup accelerator. Uh, it's a little more generalist, but that's been really exciting as well. Yeah, they provide some great resources for y'all and like n- from networking to actual, phys- you know, resources, fundraising, expertise to really help these innovative ideas get off the ground and maintain that momentum. So very cool. I'm glad you're participating in those great programs. And I briefly mentioned the mission of Upshift, but can you give me the overview of your business model, your goals, and how that is all leading you to achieve your mission and vision? Sure. I mean, essentially, we see the future is connected, electric, shared, and autonomous. And when we draw all those lines together, they converge into one point, which is that you'll subscribe to a car that comes to you on the days you drive and goes away on the days you don't, and you won't have to think about it the rest of the time. So that's the business model that we're building. Uh, And what we've seen is that about half of all cars in cities are only driven a few days a week, maybe one, two, three days a week, uh, typically. And we think those could be currently replaced with a car as a service, uh, as a, as a, basically a fractional car subscription, as it were. Uh, and that's that's what we've been that's what we've been building out. Very cool. So, yeah, I mean, certainly, I wonder with like everything going remote too, that people are commuting less. You know, with more absolutely. Mm-hmm. Working yeah, thanks home. for thanks for reminding me. Yeah, so uh, people are doing more and more hybrid commutes these days. So they're only going into the office a couple of days a week, uh, but they still have to buy a car, and then the car just sits there. And so maybe you and your wife are, uh, you know, have two cars, uh, but you only both need them on Tuesdays. But now suddenly you have these cars who are just sitting around. Um, 
And so I think that's a that's a big challenge that people are facing. The other one is we go towards electric is that a lot of people who uh, live in an apartment in a city don't have a garage. They don't have anywhere to charge. And so there's street parking and dealing with public charging, which is a nuisance. And so the idea of just subscribing to a electric car that gets delivered to your door whenever you need it with a uh, fully charged. And then we take care of the charging after you're done driving it to work or wherever it is you needed to go that day. Uh, that's a big value prop. And then, you know, if you want to go on a longer road trip, you just take a hybrid and don't worry about charging on your on your road trip. So I think there's a lot of solutions that, that uh, a lot of problems that we solve for in terms of urban mobility and, and just making car ownership more seamless and, and more uh, more green. Definitely. Uh, so, yeah, that's a, a good point is there are I've heard someone recently refer to it as garage orphans where people don't have a garage. They don't really have the best way or a really simple, simplistic way of let me just charge my EV when it's sitting there, when I'm not using it. Um, so to kind of bridge mm -hmm. that gap with I still might want to drive electric if I do drive, but to take advantage of it comes charged um, is really important, I think. Mm -hmm. So what is your footprint at this time? How how big is Upshift? Where are you in your in your stage of growth? Yeah, we're still fairly early stage. Uh, so we're uh, operating here in San Francisco. Uh, you know, we've we've had on the order of you know hundreds of members at this point who have come in and out of our service. Uh, so we're at the point now where we figured out the business model and we've uh, we, we're we're looking to expand and grow the the business to new markets and also around the Bay Area. Um, and uh, yeah, we've built out our full technology stack. So we have a member app, so you can book a car you can set all your personalized preferences uh like you know drive mode settings temperature settings name your car the idea is that that it looks and feels like it's a car you own even if you're not getting the exact same car every time you want it to feel like it's yours and uh, uh then the car gets delivered uh whenever you need it uh and you drive it for as long as you want and then when you're done you just park and walk away anywhere in our san francisco service zone and our team will come pick it up uh, charge it or gas it and you know repark it clean it service it, et cetera. Uh, and so we also have a delivery driver app as well. Uh, we've integrated vehicle telematics across uh, the entire technology stack so that you can locate, unlock, and drive the car, kind of similar to other car share models. Uh, so you don't have to meet anybody to get keys or anything like that. Um, and then we have a whole backend system so we can manage uh, the administration of membership accounts and plans and also uh, capture all the data that's coming off of the system. Uh, all the connected car data that we're capturing over a million miles of connected car driving data uh, from 10,000 plus bookings. And then we have um, all the ability to assign uh, delivery jobs as well to the concierge team. So hmm. I, that seems important, this personalization part, especially if I'm going to be, you know, having this subscription based fee for something that I kind of want to feel connected to the way that I get around. Yeah. And we're able to really personalize our cars, but with the shared model, did you how quickly did you learn that that this is a, a value point to our customers i mean it's it's something that uh i really wanted it to look and feel like car ownership because i feel like it, you know on-demand rental car is is one thing but I, I i really wanted it to feel like this is a car you own now obviously you can't just like leave your stuff in the car that's one thing that you can't really do with a shared model but everything else you know can you eventually what we want to build is actually an api integration so that all of your settings are personalized just by walking up to the car and unlocking with your phone. And then you would be able to have that same experience everywhere you go. So if you're in New York or LA or San Francisco or whatever other market that we're in, you would actually be able to just have your car be there in your pocket everywhere you go. It becomes this completely virtualized car ownership experience. Uh, and it, you know that's it's kind of next generation car ownership. Definitely. Okay, super cool. What made you start with San Francisco? You know, it has kind of a, a unique and compelling mix of like transit, but not great transit, uh, density, but you know, it's not Tokyo or, or New York. Um, it uh, has people who are willing to try new things, who are very, uh, you know, open to experimentation, people who are sustainability conscious. Uh, and, you know, it has a lot of different transportation alternatives and so this can kind of fit into that broader ecosystem in a way where if you start somewhere where there's kind of nothing then you're you know it, it's a little challenging to have there's no backstop you know if something fails you know it's it doesn't fit into that that more holistic mix um and yeah there are kind of a variety of things but you know i would say primarily it's parking is hard transit is decent 
and people don't actually need a car all the time but it's kind of like there's enough things you want to do that require a car like going hiking on the weekends or visiting family or friends in south bay or getting to work midweek a couple days a week i mean there, there are certain things that are just hard to do without a car uh around here in the bay area and you mentioned a little bit before how this is distinct from other maybe like rental car programs or car sharing programs was there a point when you realized that it needed to be that different or, or did you kind of start there and you said well this doesn't maybe you've seen it fail or that it could be improved what was the journey there yeah so i have never owned a car until i bought a bunch of cars for this company uh i lived around the world and cities both in uh, us europe and asia and found kind of the same problem everywhere i i had used various rental car and car share platforms and it's just a lot of issues with predictability reliability consistency you know cars are you know, dirty you know i've had like dirty underwear in the back seat i've had to stick my hand out the window because the turn signal is broken i've had to put air in the tires because no air in the tires i get to the car and it's not actually there and then you call call support and figure out what to do uh i've had to put gas in a car to go to the grocery store because it was like literally below empty just like all these kinds of issues where i'm like i just i'm not looking for some like luxury experience i just want it to work like i, I don't really care what the car is uh, i just want it to be clean and you know charged or gassed and ready to go and in good service and i don't want to have to like spend 30 minutes cleaning the car or gassing it or calling support because there's no air in the tires every time i get in the car <clears throat> Yeah, that would like strip the value away of the whole the whole idea is that it's supposed to be simpler or at least simple. And um, yeah, OK, so clearly you saw that there from a lot of different examples, this could be a lot better. And yeah. one part of this is, OK, a, 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 fle a fleet of cars that people can drive around. But then it also like who's your customer? What kind of benefits can you take advantage of and where is transportation going? And of course, more electrified, if not fully electric options are you know, this is growing, growing in adoption, growing in popularity, growing in terms of the regulation that is, you know, pushing it forward. Did you start out with the idea that this would uh, be hybrid, be an electric fleet? Yeah, a couple th points there. So uh, one is, uh, you know, first I thought, oh, this is just me. I'm, I'm kind of a weirdo who wants to buy a car just so I can go hiking on the weekends. And then I started asking around. I was like, no, everybody's doing this. There's like half of all the cars in San Francisco are being driven about 6,000 miles per uh, per year, uh, you know, about half the national average or even less. And, you know, these are cars that are just, you know, kind of weekend cars, or maybe it's that car that you just take to work a couple days a week. You know, there's, it's, there's a lot of cars out there that are, that are not being driven very frequently. And, you know, even if you look nationally, there's something like 60 million Americans driving less than 10,000 miles a year. There's 1.2 cars per licensed driver. I mean, there's just more cars that we know what to do with. And they're not, a lot of them are not getting driven as much as we think. And so there's kind of this glut of, uh, you know, underutilized assets lying around. And, you know, car sharing is, has had 25 years to solve that problem. And so is in rideshares had, you know, over, I don't know, 15 years at this point. And people are just driving less and less, but they still own cars, you know. And so I think that's, that's where the opportunity lies. You know, see people who are renting their cars out on peer-to-peer -peer car share platforms. And you're like, well, if you own a car that you drive so little that you can rent it out six days a week, do you really need to own that car? Why? Like, what is that doing for you? Um, and so I think that's, you know, and you look at the car share data and you see that once people get to about once a week in usage, they they quit and they buy a car. And that seems like just a pretty low breakage point. It seems like we ought to be able to push that needle up a little bit to two or three days a week. And in so doing, replace all those cars that are sitting around underutilized and turn that parking space. That's really the most valuable resource we have in cities right now. Turn that into parklets and uh, bike lanes and transit corridors and rideshare pickup and delivery pickup plant a tree there it was funny you said paving the way and i was like i'm trying to unpave <laughs> i'm not trying to pave anything <laughs> uh, so uh but it's it's sort of an interesting how those how those uh expressions get into our discourse but um uh, but yeah i mean that's that's really the the idea here and you know if you look at electrification more broadly too you kind of look back on and peel up, you know, pop the hood, so to speak, on uh, the operations side of things. There's a lot of challenges and complexity there on existing models, too, where cars, you have to have availability of a car near every user at every time. And so you need extremely high density. You need to pay for extremely expensive parking real estate. 
the cars don't get utilized very heavily, maybe 30% of the time, and the car is getting utilized, the parking space is sitting there vacant, and you, you know, you might have driven up and been like, oh my God, here's like the most precious parking space in downtown San Francisco. And it says car share only and nobody can use it from nine to five because like that car is out being, you know, doing something and you're like, that's extremely inefficient use of space. Why are we doing that? Um, So, you know, and then, of course, because the cars are underutilized and they're distributed throughout the city, it's very hard to manage them. Uh, There's a, you know, cleaning them, gassing them, taking them for service. I mean, somebody's got to run around and, you know, deal with all that. And it's it's just hard to get to them frequently enough to, to keep the service quality high at a price point that's affordable for everybody and make the math work. So that's why, as an end user, your, your you know, experience suffers because they, you know, maybe somebody only goes to that car once or twice a month to go check on it. And, you know, if the car has been to the beach a dozen times in the meantime, and it's, it's kind of trash <laughs> by the time you get to it covered in sand and dog hair. So that's just a big challenge with the space. And so, what we envision is that you actually wouldn't use any of those precious, valuable real estate parking spaces. You'd actually have a centralized mobility hub that's in a lower demand area, like let's say under a highway somewhere where nobody really wants to be in particular anyway. And that's where you've got all your charging and your car parking, and you only need a fraction of your fleet to actually be sitting there at any given time. And so let's say these quarter million cars in San Francisco that are only getting used a couple of days a week, you share it with you know, you turn that into like 50,000 cars that are shared by those 250,000 people. And out of those 50,000 cars, maybe only 10,000 of them are actually parked at any given time. The rest of them are out in use. And maybe only half of those 10,000 are actually sitting on a charger. So now you need 5,000 chargers in a centralized facility uh, or maybe in 10 centralized, 10 facilities throughout the city. And that's just a radically different problem to solve when it comes to vehicle electrification in cities where you say, wow, how could we get like a handful of mobility hubs with a small number of chargers and every 30 to 60 minutes, you're like pulling a car off the charger and sticking another one on. I mean, that's that's a totally different problem to solve than trying to say, how do we get a quarter of a million people who don't use their cars that sit parked all the time to have them just sit there and be plugged into like a curbside, you know, charger for six days because they don't drive their car until Saturday. It's like, that is, sure, we could do that. That just seems like a wildly inefficient way to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. It definitely looks like a a total reframing of, we've been going about it this way, but I have this other solution that, that would work. So for these mobility hubs, you know, with fleets, a lot of the time, we consider level two charging because the fleets only yep. move sometimes, but that's more like commercial fleets, I'd say, that are doing their delivery. So uh, with the charging yep. infrastructure that you're thinking for this kind of model, would there be DC fast charging necessary? I think you'd have some of both. I think you'd you'd have as much as possible. You'd you know, park it overnight and leave it there. Uh, we're also looking at uh, remote control car deliveries. So not full autonomous, but... Uh, teleoperated vehicles and that'll enable us to bring the cars back to you know usually people take the car out during the day and then it just parks overnight uh doesn't get used overnight so you could bring it back to a base plug it in and charge it overnight on an l2 and then send it back out again in the morning for somebody who wants to go to work or whatever they're trying to do that day Uh, so i think you know for probably for 80 percent of your use cases you you could get away with l2 and then i think you probably want some quick charging for like oh my god this car came back and we got to flip it really quick and we only have an hour like you could plug it in in 30 minutes, get it back to 80% and send it back out the door. So you probably have some of that as well, but you probably for most of it, you could do L2. Mm -hmm. That's typically the ratio that I think I hear in general, even at large scale is like mostly the level two is necessary. And then of course we need the DC fast charging for all the other scenarios, of course, um, for that. Yeah. Yeah. And we're trying to, we're also trying to figure out how to optimize existing capacity on the parking and charging side. Right. So we don't necessarily want to go build all that infrastructure ourselves. There's plenty of infrastructure out there where it's like idle parking and charging, especially overnight where, you know, garages are basically sitting empty in the city and, you know, they might have lots of chargers in them. And so how can you leverage that idle capacity on the parking and charging side, not so much the car side. I think that's something we actually want to build out our own fleet, but on the parking and charging side, why do I want to build my own custom, you know, uh, parking and charging? I mean, that stuff is already here. We, we have way too much parking in San Francisco, not too little. That's, that's my thesis. It's more about how do you optimize that parking and make better use of it, get it more thoroughly utilized throughout the day and throughout the week. 
Hmm. So that's pretty key to your business model then is using kind of what's already there, but perhaps, you know, at least in your perspective could be used better, but also not only the parking spaces, yeah. but the charging infrastructure, which is pretty expensive to install, maintain and operate. I mean, it could be a mix, right? Like you could have your own, maybe you have one base that's like your base, but then you're kind of constantly moving around a dozen or so other bases where it's, oh, well, there's no opera going on right now, but the opera house has a, you know, a zillion parking spaces, but it's Tuesday and nobody's going to the opera. So there's a bunch of parking over there or, oh, it's, you know, next to the stadium, there's, you know, there's a game every other day throughout the year, but on the days there's a game, forget about it. But on the days there aren't, there's a ton of parking over there, right? And so there's all kinds of different things like that. Even like the, there's a big shopping center in downtown San Francisco. Well, Christmas, they have to have a zillion parking spaces for the Christmas rush. But on like, you know, in August, they have like, you know, 20% of the, you know, the entire floor with like no cars in it, right? So there's, there's all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, those are just like the big obvious examples. But I mean, you know, if you just look at your average parking garage in any city, nine to five, they're, they're pretty full, but like evenings, even weekends, you know, they're, they're actually pretty vacant, you know, and what we see is that a lot of our cars are out doing stuff nine to five, they're not needing to be parked. And, you know, the overnight is actually when they need to be parked. So I think there's just generally a way to better leverage existing idle real estate capacity. Mm hmm. I'm curious about your partners here because those are, you know, I'm thinking of city, city land, you know, city planning in a way. And then also like, you know, the, whoever owns the parking garages that you're talking about, who have been key partners in your uh, discovery in mm -hmm. your, you know, putting out your minimally viable product and, and launching this so far, who's been most helpful? Maybe who did you think would be helpful, but hasn't, who are you still waiting <laughs> to partner with? Yeah, ironically. So I'm actually a trained urban planner, uh, master's uh, from MIT in city planning. And the sort of surprise, I guess, is that I did initially go to the city and say, hey, we want to do this. And they're kind of just like, uh, I don't know, like, it's kind of not really something we want to get involved in. Um, so we haven't actually had any particular support from the city, which has been, frankly, a little disappointing. Uh, you know, I think in San Francisco is that there's a bit, of, it's a bit understandable in the sense that there's a lot of startups that have um, kind of moved fast and break things and they don't necessarily play well with regulators. And then also they tend to like, you know, do stuff that they shouldn't and then ask for forgiveness later kind of thing. And so, but it was a little, a little disappointing to be like, Hey, I would like to work with you. And then they're kind of like, I don't know, like, you know, if we're busy. <laughs> so, and, and I think part of the challenge is like the data doesn't really exist for the kind of things we want to do. Right. So like, if I go to the city, I say, look, I want to have a permit to park in any city garage and i want to be able to drive my cars in and you know park anywhere uh like you tell me the data you tell me when you know there's no game on or no opera on or whatever it is and like i'll tell you know i'll send my cars over there when when you know you have lots of supply and i've got demand and i don't care if it's at the opera today and the game you know the stadium tomorrow like as long as it's somewhere in our service area it's fine um they don't have the data they don't have the data to share on that and they don't have a way to like their their structure for parking is like okay i've got one car with one license plate with one vin and it gets permit to park in this garage 30 days a month and you know if you want to park that car in a different garage or you want to park a different car in the same parking spot like it, it just kind of explodes the model they're not flexible like that so that's been that's been a big challenge as well. Um, so I think that the most traction we've been getting with is actually other startups, you know, other companies that are trying to do innovative stuff on the parking side and on the charging side. We've gotten a lot more traction actually with them um, because you know there's other companies that are trying to solve all kinds of different problems in the in the ED space in particular, and we've had a lot of traction with folks who are excited and eager to learn what the challenges are with you know fleet electrification and how they might be able to solve those problems like can we leverage condo towers that maybe had to were mandated to build a bunch of ev chargers but they're not getting used as much like could we park a few evs in their garage and then let their residents use them sometimes and then have our team go in there and deliver them to other people outside of the building at other times i mean there's there's different things like that we've explored we haven't done any of those things yet but that's those are definitely some of the options we've we've been considering with other startups that makes sense um it is disappointing that the city can't 
or doesn't chooses not to work so directly with these innovative ideas when they can really be a catalyst for this kind of change. And then also, yeah, they might be yeah. jaded because of, you know, entrepreneurs tend to be a little naughty, which is encouraged because you do kind yeah. of need to push the boundaries. So it's, it's an interesting balance well, there. It's a bit of a balance. I mean, I, I think it's, it's a little bit self-inflicted wound in some regards because the, the people who uh, work in those industries, you know, work in cities tend to be, uh, in my experience, you know, not that they're definitely innovative, but they're a little less like they're a little more risk averse with good reason. Right. Because like the incentives are, are very different. Right. Like if you're working in a city, your incentive is like to keep people safe, make sure everybody can walk on the sidewalk, make sure nobody gets hurt. Like those are your incentives. Right? You're not motivated by like making the most profit. Right. Whereas like somebody who's, I don't know, got the latest scooter share or whatever, like their incentive is like get a zillion people on your scooter and then like, you know, if it pisses someone off, like worry about it later, you know, like that's not their problem. Right. And so I think that's, that's where there's a bit of a disconnect, but yeah, it is a little, a little frustrating when you kind of go up to, to companies, to the city and be like, Hey, we want to do something innovative. And they're kind of like, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe we'll do something helpful, but maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Um, we'll see. I think it's, it's also like a bit of a challenge of like, there's been a lot of companies that have kind of said that they're having a positive impact on car ownership but then they don't show the data and they don't have like the receipts, so to speak. And so uh, I think they've also ha been burned a little bit by that, where they want to be very cautious about where they supply various kinds of incentives and resources, because they want to make sure that they're incentivizing stuff that's going to have a, a net positive impact, which kind of, you know, makes them more inclined to like only work with larger companies that have years of data and have like the, you know, research to, to validate what they're doing. Um, and, uh, and then the third part is, uh, I don't know if it's third, how many parts there are, but the other challenge, at least in San Francisco is that, uh, existing car share players that got in, you know, 20 years ago, set a bunch of rules around parking, uh, mandates and, and parking regu you know, there are car share parking incentives where you get like half price parking if you're a car share. However, they defined car sharing in a very specific way that is basically exactly what car share was 20 years ago and if you're doing anything that's not exactly that you don't you can't get any of the incentives and so you that's a that's a bit of a, a barrier to entry as well that's that's made it challenging for new entrants to try new things and to like you know even if it's going after a different demographic uh and trying to solve a different problem it's just you know you basically have to like build a whole different policy infrastructure to support it so you know all of that has made it just kind of like eh it's not really worth the hassle. I'd rather just work with startups yeah. who are like want to move fast and like try new things and, you know, maybe get a condo tower or a parking garage who's excited about doing something new. That's a lot easier Definitely. than trying to get the city to turn around and do something. Yeah. Avoid the bureaucratic timeline, the bureaucratic. But unfortunately, tools. unfortunately that, yeah, exactly. But unfortunately that puts the city in a, in a spot where they're kind of net by necessity, almost only responding to things after it's kind of too late to be, you know, you know, once you're in an antagonistic position with a gigantic company that's got like a zillion dollars behind it, and now you're trying to figure out how to work with it. It's like, well, if you started earlier and made it easier, you, you'd have a better relationship once you got there. But yeah, but there's there's a bunch of challenges with that. Yeah, sound, sounds like it that kind of we're figuring out live on the on the on the fly and you're having to just push through and kind of continue to prove what yeah. you're doing which is not unheard of in the startup space for sure yeah yeah and, i mean uh, i will say i've had very very positive and productive conversations around the remote vehicle the remote driving uh there's definitely been support on that side and um that's something that we expect would be there moving forward so i mean it's cool. all yeah it's part, part of the challenge with all of this is like whatever we do is always in the context of whatever everybody else does. And so if there are other kind of bad apples, so to speak, or bad actors, they can kind of, you know, spoil the, spoil the, the bunch for everybody else that is trying to do things the right way uh, because, you know, people get burned and then they're like, oh, you're just one of those tech startup companies that's like doing all these things, like moving fast and breaking things and doesn't care about regulations and is antagonistic towards government and, and then they understandably are like, I don't know if we want to work with these companies. Like they're kind of annoying to deal with. And like, so you, you have to kind of like overcome that. It's the same on the insurance side. You know, a lot of insurance companies are just have been burned by, by so many of these companies that, you know, are not doing things in, in good ways. And then when you go and talk to them, you have to like first 
kind of like build trust, you know, that you're you're not just like some obnoxious, you know, founder that that wants to just do whatever they feel like and and doesn't care about their needs and and their uh, uh, goals, you know. So that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 complicated to say the least. And um, hard speaking. It's it's hard and you have to have some grit to get through it. So props to you for continuing on. And as uh, something that we spoke about before that I'd love to kind of start speaking about now is fleet electrification, sure. right? And that, yeah. um, you know, you have the options of hybrid, you have the option of fully electric, battery electric vehicles, and mm -hmm. kind of the choice between those and different incentives. And you've you know, we want to electrify your fleet. You've done it before, but it has also revealed some challenges that maybe I wouldn't be aware of. Maybe you weren't aware of, but probably the, you know, the general person wouldn't be aware of that come along when you're trying to electrify a fleet. And it's, this is gaining traction globally trying to electrify fleets. So could we discuss some of the challenges that you've encountered while either just building or transitioning your fleet to electric and hybrid vehicles? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, when we first started the company years ago, we wanted to go electric and that was always the, the part of the equation, right? It was like connected, electric, autonomous and shared use. And uh, all of those things have been slower moving than we would like. You know, it's uh, I think the connected and shared, I think we're we're doing pretty good on those fronts. The autonomous keeps getting pushed out five or 10 years. You know, it's kind of felt perennially like a few years out. Uh, that feels like we're getting closer. Uh, and then the electric, uh, you know, I feel like we're a lot closer now than when we started for sure. But there's still a bunch of challenges. And so like last year, uh, we started with Priuses. Uh, and then last year, we tried a couple of EVs. So we tried a Model 3 and an Ionic 5, both of which great cars, uh, certainly happy to drive them around. Uh, but the challenges were uh, a few things. One that I think most people, uh, and, and I should say that we we offboarded both of them at the end of last year because we just couldn't, we couldn't get them to work. Um, we are still trying to get back into the EV space, uh, but uh, there was sort of a broader uh, exodus, shall we say, from the EV markets, from fleets uh, at the end of last year. And we were part of that because there are just so many different challenges. So there was a lot of excitement about it about a year ago with EV fleets. And, every, you know, Hertz was getting in with 100,000 orders from Tesla and, uh, you know, Autonomy, which is a car subscription service doing all EVs. There are a bunch of companies that were going really aggressively in the EV space. And so, you know, we were like, okay, let's dip our toes and try a few. And the challenges we found were kind of manifold and, and some not quite as expected. So, um, you know, obviously we had the, tra the challenges of charging logistics, uh, you know, was, was something that we kind of predicted going in. And it was, in fact, a challenge. We didn't have our own uh, centralized charging facilities. And so we were relying on public charging, which has all the challenges people are fairly well aware of at this point of broken chargers or, you know, wait in line or, you know, you can't always, you know, sometimes you can reserve one, but oftentimes you can't and you get there and there's nothing. You got to sit there for 20 minutes waiting for someone to come out and, you know, all those kinds of things. And you can imagine trying to scale a fleet by sitting at the grocery store parking lot for half an hour waiting for a car to charge. I mean, it's just not, not really a very effective strategy. Um, so, you know, and because of our delivery strategy, it just, it, it made our costs kind of skyrocket on those cars because we had to have somebody basically just sitting in the car for half an hour waiting for it to charge even on these super fast chargers and some of the fastest charging cars on the market that we could get um so that was one challenge um the other was uh a little less obvious was the billing and payments were kind of complicated so the way that we do our gas cars is we bring it full uh and then we gas it at the end and then we charge you whatever we read off the pump um with an EV, it's a little trickier because, uh, first of all, the, the amount that we read off the pump can vary pretty wildly. Like it can be 2x depending on, you know, when you charge it, where you charge it and how you charge it can be hugely variable. Um, the other is we weren't charging all the way to 100% because it's a lot slower. So we're charging 80%, but then sometimes we might charge to 85 or 75 or, you know, it's just it was hard to get like a consistent kind of top off point. And then you had to kind of try to manage that with like you know, making sure everybody was charged kind of the right amount. And then it was hard to do just like a mileage based price because the price per charge was just wildly all over the place. And um, and then the other challenge we had on the charging side was the uh, um, the billing because we had it set. So all of our cars were connected to our credit card. 
And so we didn't want to have to have somebody swipe a card every time, especially when we picked up the car and had to charge it. It was just a lot more seamless for our operations to not have to deal with that. Uh, but then we found very quickly that if some member takes the car for a couple of days and they plug in the car, you know, halfway through their booking, now we get hit with a bill for 10 bucks worth of charging or whatever, which is not the end of the world. But then we had to figure out how to how to manage and account for that and build them for that and like track it down and, you know, be aware that it was happening. And we were like, wow, how do we scale that? That's that's super challenging to keep tabs on to the point that there's like startups that are literally doing exclusively that problem that they're solving for fleets. I mean, it's just, it's a really big challenge. Um, and then I think the the big, the biggest problem that was really the reason we pulled out was not so much these, because I think these are solvable with mobility hubs and software and, you know, other things that you could integrate. Um, the, the thing that's really been the roadblock at the moment is actually the residual values. And so that's, that's really what I think killed a lot of these uh, uh, in fleet initiatives to go electric last year is we saw a lot of rental fleets go belly up last year because they just they went all in on EVs and they're all enthusiastic and it's great. But then, you know, you have Elon Musk waking up one morning and deciding a Model 3 is suddenly 20 percent cheaper than it was yesterday. And, you know, if you're sitting there holding the bag on 100,000 of them, you, you just lost millions of dollars overnight. You know, and, and any rental fleet looks at that and goes, holy cow, I can't. I can't run a business like that. Like I'll, I'll do Corollas all day long because I know what they're worth and they're, they're not going to suddenly drop the bottom out on me. Like they've, they've been running them for decades and, you know, the price is very consistent and, and predictable. Right. And so I think that's, that's really the key element. You know, if you go to your finance partner in a, in a rental fleet, they're all working with finance partners, except for the really big ones. And uh, the finance partner doesn't want to, doesn't want to fund them because they don't know what they're going to be worth in two years. Years. and especially with new but even with you know a tesla or a bolt or something i mean it's still fairly fairly new and nobody could tell you what the price of those things is going to be you know i was just looking on twitter somebody saying oh i bought this model y in 2022 for 70k and now it's worth 24 and you're like that's a bummer if you're like some wealthy guy who just wanted to get in early and like play around with an ev like too bad but like you know if you're a fleet and that just happened to a thousand of your cars I mean, that just ruins your business. I mean, it's just not something you can, it's a total nightmare, right? And so we had like our Ionic 5, I think we lost like 15 grand on it in a year or something. I mean, it just, it wasn't penciling. It was like 10x more expensive than running any of our other cars. I mean, it wasn't even in the same bulk. It wasn't like, oh, it's 10% more, but we can kind of get it back in rental revenue. It was like, it's 10x more expensive and nobody wants to pay even like you know a twenty dollar markup on the thing so you're like okay now it's sitting around and losing a lot of value and there's a lot of hassle and headache on the charging and the demand isn't there and we're just like this is just way it's not working so that's why we that's why we pulled out but you know i, I do think there's an opportunity if we can get like a affordable ev which has been a perennial challenge you can get it the residuals to be predictable and hold and be stable is a is a second big challenge and then of course you've got all the charging and operational complexity that that people are well aware of i think another piece that people tend to not think of is like you you see a lot of posts of, of people on the internet that are like oh it's so great to have an ev because the maintenance is really low and nothing ever breaks and i'm like well my hybrids nothing breaks on either they're all brand new and you know you take them in for service every five thousand miles and that's about it i mean the only thing you have to really deal with is tires and wipers and when I see that on EVs, the thing that I see on EVs is, well, you only have to deal with tires and wipers on a new car, but you're going to have to put on tires more frequently because they're heavier and there's more torque. And I'm sitting there going, wow, tires are like my biggest maintenance expense as a rental car operator, effectively, that has, uh, you know, cars that are all new under warranty. <laughs> like the only thing you have to worry about is tires. So if you have to put on two sets of tires before you offload it versus one, you just doubled your maintenance cost. And now a set of tires is like a thousand dollars. So like, that's a pretty big lift, you know, for, for an operator to go, wow, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. You know, that's a, that's a huge cost. So I think these are a lot of the, you know, cause you're not driving it for a decade. I mean, any rental fleet is not, you know, they hold it for a year or two, that's it. And then they, they offboard it and get another one. So um, it's just a very different uh, set of challenges that, um, that police have, and then I guess uh, another piece I'll, I'll I'll mention is the the tax credits are really challenging 
to manage as a fleet, especially as a startup, because they're not really optimized around an early stage startup in particular, because you don't necessarily have a ton of profits to like, you know, run your tax credits against. Um, and structuring all that, figuring that all out is super complicated and very costly and time consuming. And I, the amount of hours of brain damage I've inflicted on myself trying to figure out how to capture tax credits and, and basically failed to do so is like, I don't even want to think about it, like how much time and effort I've tried to do that. Um, so that's a big challenge. And then even with used cars, there's no way to buy used as a fleet operator and get any tax credits. So if I buy a used Bolt, for example, I can get a used Bolt really cheap right now, but I can't get the tax credits. And so the second I pull it off the lot and I buy it, I've lost $4,000 because the guy I sell it to could get $4,000 off when they go buy it at a dealer. So why would they want to buy it for me for less than 4000 cheaper than, than I paid for it? So it's all these kinds of things where like we had, for example, the Ionic, part of the reason we lost so mu much money on it is because we didn't have any, we didn't get the tax credits on it. And so we lost $7,500 the day we bought it. You know, it's like these kinds of things that make it really hard to, uh, to figure out. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of challenges. It's not just like, oh, you want to go electric or you don't. It's like, okay, yeah. if you want to go electric, man, you got to, you got to really want it and you got to have like a bunch of, you got to work your butt off to make it work. And you, and you, you, frankly, you need to have like resources behind you to throw out all these challenges to like the time and the money and the team and everything to, to try and figure out how to make it happen. Cause it's not easy. Yeah. It's, it gets so complex that what becomes straightforward is that we just might not be able to do this, which is unfortunate, especially when, you know, you consider all the positive impacts from electric vehicles Absolutely. and how, you know, they're popular Absolutely. and that might be tied to your mission. So it's a bit of a downer. Yeah. So clearly there are clear hindrances to electrifying a fleet, especially as a startup, you know, and you know, Man, honestly, even the hybrids, of... even yeah. the hybrids are hard because you know, the hybrid, so we have Corolla hybrids right now and they hold their value exceptionally well and they're fairly affordable and it's not that much more expensive to buy one, but it's, I don't know, 1500 bucks more to buy a hybrid versus a non-hybrid. And that means I got to pass that on to my, you know, to the what I charge people and some people care about that but some people don't and they would rather pay five bucks less or whatever and get a non-hybrid right and so it's like it there is there are challenges to, to even with even with that to try and make it uh, uh you know as green as we can make it you know because most people are, are more focused on price than they are on on the green angle right and so that's that's where it just it just gets really hard you know it's it, for example we want to get an suv on the platform we had an suv last year or for a few years and we we haven't been able to figure out how to make even a hybrid suv work because the additional cost of a hybrid suv is quite substantial and then the um uh willingness to pay you know is, is also sort of challenging to make make all those numbers work so that's why we're kind of focused on like a corolla hybrid because it's like you can get a 50 mpg car and your operations are are more seamless uh and they hold their value and everybody is pretty comfortable with them for you know nine out of ten use cases and so but how do we kind of move from that into even like a bolt or something i mean it's it's a big leap it is so it, it makes me wonder you know, of course, you're learning all these lessons, you're learning what the challenges are, you're able to inform other people, inform your future decisions. But, you know, how do you feel? Do you feel like you're better set to face, you know, the future challenges, the current challenges in electrifying fleets? Or what do we need to do to overcome these challenges? It's kind of, I mean, it's out oh, of your boy. hands in a way. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's out of my hands. I mean, I would say that the number one thing that I hear people talking about is, you know, charging related stuff. Uh, but the number one thing that I know is an issue on the fleet side is residual values. And so you can talk all day long about how hard it is to charge and how consumers aren't willing to pay or don't understand how they work or have all kinds of questions and concerns or what. That's all great. That's like way down the list of things that I need to worry about as a fleet operator. Because if I can't buy the car because it loses too much value, end of story. I'm not even going to think about all those other problems. Like first, I first I have to get stable residual values and and that's that's a, that's a huge problem for for any kind of rental and and the thing is that people i think don't think about too is that rental fleets uh provide a kind of a, an important role in the ecosystem I and mean, they provide a place for cars to get sold by the manufacturer and they also provide a 
essentially a used car manufacturer for people who want affordable cars. You know, you get a car that's got 30,000 miles on it and it's 18 months old. I mean, that's, you can get a great deal if you go to Hertz or Enterprise and their used car market, right? And so there's, there's a huge opportunity there. Like right now you can buy a used Tesla pretty cheap from Hertz, but you know, wouldn't it be great if they were a reliable manufacturer of a cheap two-year-old Tesla? But if they can't stabilize the prices, Hertz has just got to run away and not, not come back. And so now you've got this huge opportunity to get a $20,000 Tesla is now gone because we haven't figured out how to make that price stable. And, and I think the, the biggest error that we had last year was, was Elon Musk waking up one day about a year ago and deciding prices would be 20% cheaper. That like one decision decimated the entire rental car EV space in one day. I mean, it was just it really devastating. Did. I mean, really cannot like overstate like how how huge of an impact that had in like in such a short period of time. I mean, maybe it was great for his quarterly returns, but I mean, it definitely ruined the long term prospects for any fleet operator wanting to do business with him. Yeah, I think that's something to consider because on the consumer side, it's like, oh, great. Like more people can buy an electric vehicle for the passenger vehicle. But if we look at other yeah. industries where this was a, detri a detrimental well, decision. It, to it, actually, even on the consumer side, it was problematic, right? So my brother bought a Model Y the November oh, yeah. before, like it was 2022. And he made 60K and he'd been waiting around for a year to get it. And then like three months after he bought it, Elon Musk suddenly decided that car was worth 40,000. It was like too bad. Should have waited, Ouch. but how would you know, right? And so then you're like, okay, well, you know, I'm reading on the internet about people who bought a Y for seventy thousand that's now worth twenty four, and they're upset about it. And you're like, why would I want to go buy a Tesla if I don't know what it's going to be worth when I go to sell in even a year or two? And if it's it so might true. go up or down or sideways, I mean, you just have no idea what it's going to be worth. I mean, the residual values are actually what the value. I mean, people don't think this way. Fleet operator, an individual will think, what's my car payment? That's actually the wrong way to think about the price of a car. It's not about the sticker price and it's not about the car payment. It's about the delta between the sticker price and what you can sell it for when you sell it and then divide by the number of months and your cost of interest on, on the capital, unless you're paying cash. And so, you know, if you buy it for, you know, 70 and sell it for 60, then, you know, the cost of that car is $10,000, not $70,000, right? And so that's what I think people don't realize when they buy a car. They're just thinking about like, like oh, well, it's, can I afford this amount up front? Can I afford this much monthly? Okay, great. That's my cost of the cars. Like that has nothing to do with the cost of your car. And that's, mm. that's where the, you know, the fleets, you know, they're, they've got teams of, you know, MBAs that are doing nothing but trying to figure out when to buy and when to sell, which cars to buy. And it's all about residuals. It's, I mean, it is. it's, it's really what it comes down to. It's nothing to do with these other numbers. Yeah. And with it being not, it's not just dynamic, but like unpredictable. It can, I, I, and it's unpredictable clear. residual values. That's really where you, that's where people want nothing to do with it because you've got such yeah, a low clearly. margin business that you do not have the margins in there to go buy a ton of cars that, you know, might go up, might go down. I mean, they're not trying to buy like into the, the next Bitcoin craze. They're, just, they're trying to, you know, have a stable, reliable return on their investment that they know in 18 months they're going to get something out of it. And that can just wash out your entire, you know, sit there and run, run a car for two years, a lot of work. And then to find out you got wiped out at the end of it, no one wants that. No. It, supposed I mean, to be your it's payday when you sell the car, not your, exactly. Not your yeah. book losses. So. No, of course. Like no business model, yeah. like sh would, would really be considering that kind of option. Like no matter in which form that it came, if you're losing that much money on this yeah. investment, it, it just really doesn't pencil. Doesn't, so it doesn't work. And I, and I think the tax incentives are also like there is there's like the 45W and there are some incentives out there, but it's it's hard to get them to work and it's it's complicated. And, you know, honestly, I wish they would just carve off a certain number and pass it on. You know, like if it's a $40,000 car, then you get $7,500 off the price and the dealer goes and deals with it with the government or whatever. But like the fact that you have to like figure out all these like tax credits and stuff, I mean, it's, it's so, so much brain damage to figure out. And if you try to do it as an individual it's not that so bad but if you're trying to do it with like hundreds or thousands of cars i mean it's just like a nightmare to, to do it all mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that that just you know it's just like a roadblock for no reason in my opinion and, 
It does. It does seem to be a, uh, yeah, too complicated, overcomplicated when we we have like a clear goal in mind, which is like to go more electric, we should make it a bit simpler, which on the surface, it might yeah. look like it, hey, cheaper EVs, but not, and, you know, more regulation that's pushing for even the manufacturing and selling of them, and, but it doesn't always play out that way. And make sure it goes into the pockets of the consumer, not the manufacturer. I think it's part of the challenge too. Like I was looking at a Bolt EV yesterday on GM's website and I was like, wow, you get a they're now priced at 31,000 for a 2023 and they were advertising a four year term for 320 bucks a month with uh, about 10,000 down. I was like, wow, why would I pay 10,000 down? That puts my cap cost at, you know, 23 or 22,000 or something. Um, and then I did the math on it. I was like, okay, so they're going to basically take the tax credit and stick it in their pocket and use that to reduce the cap cost. And then you're going to pay 320 a month for four years. That's going to burn that car down to 7,000 dollars in residuals when they take it back in four years so they're basically telling you the car is you know worthless hunk of junk they take it back if that's what they're telling you and they're going to take all that money from the tax credit and stick it in their pocket and you're not going to care because it's not you know didn't come out of your pocket but it's like wow that something just doesn't really hit right with with that math i'm like mm -hmm. why why would that sounds great for gm but i'm not sure why i would do that as a consumer Unless I just yeah, am not you, thinking clearly and don't understand how the map works, which most people don't. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you see, you see the the headline or the, you know the the numbers right there, just, and you're like, okay. Yeah, they're like, well, it's only a couple grand out of my pocket, and then three twenty a month. I can afford that. And yeah, the rest of it exactly. Is, you know, noise. Like you don't understand how all the all the other stuff works. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So. so Part of me starts to be like, okay, yeah. so what's the solution? Here are these challenges. Oh, Here is, is what is hindering these, but there it. Part of it is, I think, even just having these discussions to highlight like what people like you have experienced directly when trying to electrify a fleet um, or just, you know, at least explore what that option would be like and being able to speak about those and kind of point out where the faults might be, where the where the weaknesses lie so that as we move forward, we can better advocate for different regulation, different ways that we enforce the tax incentives. But I mean, I don't know. I, I am the kind of like, how do we solve it? But it seems like we're just at the uh, yeah, point of know. kind I mean, of identifying there's... what's wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what the solution is. I mean, definitely like create a BB finance for, for rental fleets. I mean, there's probably some opportunity there if you can figure out how to make that work. Because I have seen some other options out there where it's like, you're just leasing the car, you're paying some kind of monthly rate and they're taking the residual value risk. But a lot of those are, are just inordinately expensive you know, for, for the, doesn't really make sense unless that's your only option. And so I, I haven't seen like anything that kind of competes with, you know, just getting a Corolla. And that's why all the rental fleets are just doing Corollas is, you know, or, you know, these other Kia Forte or whatever, these kind of base model cheapest car you can get. That's just a regular gas car. And that's a lot of cars. There's a lot of cars in rental fleets and, and it's a huge uh, opportunity that, that's kind of overlooked. And the other thing is that there's a lot of people who probably would be happy to try out an EV for a week and see if they like it, right? And so there's a lot of ways to try and also uh, teach people, give them you know, low barrier to entry access to an EV. Um, I mean, those can be basically onboarding ramps for people to get into an EV lifestyle. So I, I think that there there's a lot of opportunities there uh, and I don't feel like there's quite as much uh, focus being put on uh, that that industry in a way that could actually move the needle. And that there are a lot of creative solutions out there, but um, you know everything tends to be more focused on consumer because that's that's where most people's heads are at. But understandably, but um, I think there's a could be more spotlight placed on it. Mm -hmm. I think that's definitely something to take away from this. And. Uh, yeah, I appreciate you, you know, coming on. This is not only like an interesting discussion, but I think it does provide a good bit of clarity, especially when we see like, well, what is the impact of Hertz divesting this much or sixth divesting of oh, the changes in the, huge. like, yeah, huge. it's, that's huge. just like a, that's like an earthquake. I mean, uh, like, yeah, because the, the opportunity for them to change the market is so huge, but it can be both positive and negative, right? So for them to pull out like that, Really, I mean, it could be years before we see these fleets come back. And you think of if Hertz gets out, then it's going to have an effect all the way down the chain, right? Like the other, their their competitors of Avis and Enterprise, obviously, going to notice, and that's going to have a big impact with them. But then all the mom and pops, you know, all the little companies with like a hundred cars, you know, all around the country, they're going to go, "Wow, if Hertz is out of here, why am I going to get into this? Forget that." 
So, you know, I, I think that's, that can't be, can't be overstated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe the mom and pops will be like, ah, well, I could do it better. Let me figure that out. And then... Yeah. I mean, it's possibly, possibly, you know, I think, uh, you know, I definitely considered like, is it, is it now a good time to buy a used car from, from Hertz and run it another year? But, you know, I, yeah. I just think it's, it's too unpredictable. You know, you just don't really know. And I think that's, that's why even our finance partners like, eh, I might give you one, but I'm not going to scale up anything right now until we, until we know what we're looking at. Mm. So I'll have to stay tuned with you to see, you know, as things undoubtedly yeah. change as they do in the space, Definitely. if anything changes that will kind of shift <laughs> up shift yeah. um, the way that you're doing yeah. things and, and perhaps lead to yeah, some yeah. other decision making that you're perhaps more confident in. Like, yeah, now it's, it's much safer to go electric for this reason or that reason. Um, but it'll be interesting yeah. to see uh, if folks are uh, interested in finding out more and contacting y'all, whatever it is, where should they go to find you? Yeah, our website is upshiftcars.com, uh, and you can find all the information you need on there. And uh, there's a contact form on there as well that'll that'll forward out to the to the right folks. Great, great, thank you. And is there anything that uh, I, we should be keeping an eye out for in the future when it comes to uh, you and Upshift? Well, we're looking to expand to new markets, so we're uh, you know keep an eye out for that. And uh, you know we are definitely interested in uh, adding an electric back to our fleet. So keep keep an eye out if we can find the right pathway for that. We definitely want to do that, and uh, hopefully we'll have better success to stuff can go around. Yeah, I mean maybe I'll ask one more question because you're in California, which is of course a beautiful mm-hmm. petri dish for going electric, right? And we have a lot of cases yeah. that we try to apply elsewhere. Is is California, or, or how much do you consider just staying in California versus in markets in other states in the U.S.? Yeah, we've explored other markets. Uh, I definitely think that from an EV standpoint, California is clearly the far and away. It's I don't know. You probably know better than I do, but I think it's like half the EV market is here. So it's it's definitely a huge, uh, huge market from the EV side. Uh, so you know, remains to be seen like how much appetite there is for for EVs in in other markets. But you know, I, I do think that hopefully it'll be nationwide uh, demand soon. Yes, totally agree. Uh, Thank you again so much for your time and your energy and coming to speak about this topic. I think it's great that we get informed and we kind of clear up all the like convoluted details that are involved really and and get a firsthand experience of what it's like to undertake this kind of project from you know the startup point of view because startups do have tons of potential so I wish you the absolute best of luck and I'm sure I will stay up to date with all that you're doing and hope to get an update from you in the future yeah. Yeah, great. No, definitely. We'll do that. Thank you so much for having me on. And uh, it's been fun to, to talk with you about all these different challenges and, uh, you know, looking forward to seeing what, what your community has to has to say about it. Definitely. Yeah. Our audience. Hello, audience. Uh, yeah, please ask, your, you know, start the discussions in the comments, ask your questions. We'll get answers for you. But um, I know that I learned a lot of things from the discussion with Ezra about how what, what the challenges are. And I'd love to know if you all know any other kind of startups that are navigating this space or any ideas that maybe you've had, or like I said, your questions would love your input. Thank you all for tuning in to the Out of Spec podcast again. We will catch you next time on the next episode. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.